do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Let's pray. Father, we praise you so much, because only in you, Lord, can we truly have peace. Especially in the things we see going on around us nowadays, Lord, even in our country, we see it. And Father, it is such a testimony to have, have peace and joy. Pray that we would always have that, Lord, that we can only get from you. Lord, we love and praise you. We look forward to what you're going to do today. Father, pray that you'd speak through Clay and touch hearts today, Lord, with your word, not through his strength or his power, but through your word. Pray that you'd fill him with your spirit today, Lord, and pray that somebody who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior might get saved today. We love and praise you. We look forward to what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. There are a few things in the bulletin. Um, so I would just trust that uh, uh, you would pick one of those up and check and see if any of that applies to you. But uh, we always do like to uh, welcome first-time visitors here with us. And if this is your first time here to, to worship with us, uh, we're not going to embarrass you in any way. But if you just hold your hand up real quickly where we can see where you're located. I thought I saw a hand there, but I guess not. I think it was just a kid. Got one over here. Okay, I still can't see it. There it is. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us today. And if you would, please just uh, fill that card out. And then if you'd put it in one of those bowls back there by the door on your way out this morning, we'd be very appreciative. Thank you. All right. Our next hymn is number 24. Hymn number 24, just over a few pages. He is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue, tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. Let's sing that out. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver. Let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Oh, my sin oppressed, go to him for rest our Our last hymn this morning that we'll sing as our congregation is an old favorite. It's hymn number 410. Go ahead and stand with us as we sing, It Is Well With My Soul, hymn number 410.
preaching on this topic, the Soul Winner Song. But before I do, our youth choir is going to come. We're going to do one more song, The Lord is My Salvation. I don't know how many of you know that, but we will put lyrics up for that. It's a song that I would love for our congregation to have memorized. It's pretty lengthy, but it explains a lot of truth that we need to be familiar with when it comes to the gospel. And as our kids come, I want to plug tonight's service. We had a great week at youth camp, even though I did have to stay in the dorm house with the boys. And the, the, uh, <clears throat> the odor began to increasingly get worse as the week went on, but we survived. But, but I, I want to just say this. I believe you as a church would have been so proud of our young people um, we had four of our young men uh, get up and preach five-minute messages, and if you didn't get to go there and hear that, they will be preaching uh, tonight. Our young men will. We had some specials that y'all haven't heard. We had some little groups made up, and some of those will sing tonight as well, and uh, so I want to encourage you to come tonight. I believe it will be uh, a major blessing for you, and, tonight, and uh, right now they're going to sing uh, the Lord is my salvation.
And uh, if you get the hang of it and you're willing to join in, uh, I love the participation. It is well with my soul. We know that. We sing that out. And uh, this is the Lord is my salvation. If you're familiar with it, go ahead and join us. You're welcome to sing with us.
Well, I love that song, and it was a song I wanted to do because, as you know, we have been having a theme of sharing the gospel this summer. Our Wednesday nights and many of our Sunday or Sunday night messages have been consistent with that theme. And this morning I'd like to preach to you a message I've entitled The Soul Winner's Song. If you would go to Psalm 40, Psalm chapter 40. That's an Old Testament passage, but the phrase winning souls actually comes from, as far as I know, the first time in Proverbs 11.30, He that winneth souls is wise, Solomon said. His father David wrote us a psalm in Psalm 40, and that's where we'll be going. But question to ask before we read the text is, do you have a song? Do you have a song? Now, I know uh, even lost folks, many times it's kind of a, uh, almost a meme now when someone says, oh, this is my song or this is my jam, and they have a song. And the truth is, as human beings, I've never met anybody who could actually say they were, were not musical at all in any form, even if you can't carry a tune in the bucket, even if the only thing you can play is a radio, you have songs that have stuck in your head or that you consider to be good, and, and music is powerful. Music is a, is a powerful thing. Uh, at camp this, this week, a uh, young man from, we had a church group, a family group from Los Angeles, California at camp with us. And Andy Harrell got up for the solo instrumental competition, and he played the best rendition of Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag you ever did hear. And I mean, when he was playing that, I had a flashback, and I was immersed in my, my cousin Carolyn, that's my dad's cousin actually, I was transported back to her little studio where she gave piano lessons, uh, initially the first time on B Street there by Aunt Nade's house. And I had a flashback of watching my cousin Carolyn's tiny hands fly over those keys as she played that music. Just that camp, that moment he broke into that, I had that flashback. And I remember uh, just the memories that came back. Music can be moving at Madison Bull, uh, no, excuse me, not Madison, Madison's wedding's coming up. At Cynthia Ashcraft's wedding, they, she came into, I believe, the theme song for a, a movie, I'm not advocating movies, Up, the movie Up. And there's a little piano melody that's played. And by the way, I, I honestly don't think I got through Up. I sat down, someone invited me to watch it. And they literally, if you haven't seen it, you might not want to watch it because, yes, it's animated, but they say, hey, in, for 10 minutes, let's pull everybody's hearts out and stomp on them. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, and it gives you a little bit of sympathy for some old crumudgeons. You never know what they have lived through, amen? But, you know, just as that music played, I had tears come to my eyes and I'm going, what? Because <laughs> I remember that that scene of that couple in Up. It only takes a few bars of the theme song from Rocky to get me ready to run, right? It can motivate you, amen? Music is important. Music can be good and it can be bad. And I will say this, do you know that music, I want to make clear, I absolutely disagree with the idea that music is amoral, that it's just neutral. It's far too powerful a language to, all, to, to be neutral. Music has a message, and this message is not about music, by the way. It is, though, about having a song. And our God is musical. So look with me at Psalms 40, and I believe you'll see how this will play in. Because Psalms 40, I believe, is a soul winner's song. It is a messianic psalm that is mentioned and referenced in the New Testament. Hebrews, the author, references some of this psalm as being the words of Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, all of the Bible could be in red letters. Amen? It is the Word of God. But stand with me as we read ten verses from Psalms 40. And then we get into the message this morning. The soul winner's song. David writing, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord... 
and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. David wasn't a preacher. He was a king. But his part to play in congregational worship was he wrote the songs. Did you know that? It's what we're reading, by the way. And I find it interesting that David did not say, I have to get motivated. I have to get pumped up and fired up to tell people of thy faithfulness and thy righteousness. Do you know he said, I can't hardly keep it in. All I have to do is not hide it. And it flows out because it was truly a new song God had put in his mouth. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I thank you for this group that's here this morning. Your church, Lord, as we meet, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here. Lord, that we would be attentive to your spirit. Thank you for meeting with us, Lord. And we want to give you glory not just with our lips, but with our lives. God, we want to bring you praise and honor and glory. You're worthy of that. And I pray that this morning we would be encouraged, we would be motivated by your word, and that you would fill our hearts by your spirit with a new song. God, help us to not view the sharing of the gospel as a burden. But God, I pray that you would fill us so full that it would just be an outflow of a heart fully immersed in your grace. God, I just pray that if someone here this morning's never been saved, that your Holy Spirit would do a work even now. And God, above all, we ask that you be glorified, lifted up and blessed this morning by what's done and said here today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There are literally hundreds of references in the Bible to singing, sing or songs, you begin to take a strong concordance. I'm just telling you, if you want to try to write down every reference to, to singing and songs, you're going to have a pretty good study load because the Bible's full of that. As a matter of fact, this largest book that we have in our Bible, Psalms, is literally a song book inserted here into the Scriptures. And so I think it ought to be noted as we begin the significance of song. There are hundreds of references in the Bible of God's people singing or having a song. And here in Psalm 40, verse 3, it says, He hath put a new song in my mouth. That phrase, He hath put a new song in my mouth, is repeated. It's something that God is credited with doing, is giving us a song. Songs are powerful. A... a, um, Years ago, an 18th century Scottish patriot named Andrew Fletcher wrote this, Let me make the songs of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Now, he was in Scotland, and his point was that as long as there was Scottish music, Scotland would remain. It would remain Scotland, and it would remain sovereign in his mind, no matter what English rules, laws, or politics began to control, he said that the songs were more important than the laws. I think that's interesting. Songs and music is something that we see in nature. God created the world. And do you know that in Isaiah 44 verse 23, he says that the world creation sings... The prophet Isaiah commands sing. He he calls for the heavens and the lower parts of the earth. He calls for mountains and forests and every tree. He said they break forth in singing. 
creation sings. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and NASA's exoplanet exploration program, the leader Elizabeth Landau says this, we cannot hear it with our ears, but the stars in the sky are performing a concert, one that never stops. The biggest stars make the lowest, deepest sounds like tubas and double basses. Small stars have high-pitched voices like celestial flutes. They're virtuosos. These virtuosos don't just play one note at a time either. Our own sun has thousands of different sound waves bouncing around inside it at any given moment. Understanding these stellar harmonies represents a revolution in astronomy. She says that we can listen to stellar music. Well, can I ask you something? Who wrote the stellar music that they're listening to? Can I just say this? That, that by the way, was not written by a Christian. She goes on to marvel how that millions of years in evolution could create such a thing. And can I just say this? Millions of years in chance and nothing did not create everything. God is the creator. And the heavens declare the glory of God. Music is powerful. It can be good. It can be bad. It is something the Bible says God is interested in. Ephesians 5, and we'll move on once we understand that singing music is significant in Scripture and in this reality that we live in. Music is important. Even the world at large understands that. That's why it's all the more important when the Bible says in Ephesians 5 that a sign of being filled with the Spirit. And can I just say this? There are some church groups that argue about certain gifts being the sign of the Spirit of God. And can I just say this? I believe that God can give the gift of tongues or give the gift of healing. Uh, I had missionaries tell me they believe God gave me the gift of tongues because I got to Mexico and just a few weeks later, I was preaching in Spanish. But can I just say this? The Bible's pretty clear what the Holy Spirit does, what He produces. Do you know the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. This is what Galatians says is how you know when someone is filled with the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit seals us and come in, comes in and begins to fill us, when we begin to surrender to the indwelling of the Spirit, Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, the best reason to not drink alcohol is because you don't want those spirits... That's what the sign on the store says they're going to give you. But be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And he says that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you will be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's what God's people should be known by, having a song, being filled with the Spirit. That new song that he puts in our mouth. Now, I'm not going to break down and preach a message on psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But there's a number, there's a variety of different kinds of songs that pleases God, that edifies the body, that worships, that points people to truth. You can sing the testimonies of God, which encourages believers. But it's been said that a song, any song, is simply a poem with pulse and with passion. A poem. A song. It's something that's been put to music. And as we read this prophecy poem that we read in Psalms 40, David's heart was full. In our text this morning, we see that David, the psalmist, he, he's giving a kind of a testimony of sorts. And so while, yes, it is messianic, I've heard one commentator, he broke down the whole psalm in the words of Christ, how that it was Christ that was delivered out of a miry pit, death in the grave and the cross. And he broke down every verse in messianic terms. But can I just say that when David penned it, David, yes, inspired by the Spirit, he was also giving a little bit of personal testimony. See, David had been saved out of some jams himself. David had been pulled out of some sticky situations. I mean, can you imagine knowing that the fighting force of the Israeli army underneath Saul was hunting you down every day? 
that you had become Israel's most wanted. David had had some sin problems that he had had to be delivered from. David had made mistakes. David had had some grief problems that he had to be pulled out of. Can you see David not just mourning after his baby died, the first child with Bathsheba there that, that he prayed for, but yet being burdened and realizing the guilt that God, listen, had so graciously pointed out to him and he had repented. Even Psalms 51, David's repentance was put to music. It was a song. Have you ever wondered what was Solomon thinking when he wrote Proverbs 11.30? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Can I just assure you, he wasn't thinking of the Romans road to salvation. (laughs) It hadn't been written, amen. I mean, Romans was way down the road. This was historically way before Christ would even come. Yet we know through the Spirit of God and the Word of God that the gospel was given, concealed, but given through prophecy and pictures and shadows and types. But what did Solomon mean? I wonder that. I wonder if it came to mind in Solomon's head when he was just a baby boy or a young man when big brother Absalom threw a military coup. Y'all remember that. I wonder if he thought about the fact that it wasn't just David and his family running. An army went with David, Joab, Absalom, and I believe the core, the mighty men. They went with David. But do you know amongst those, a third of David's fleeing, protective, personal army, there were 600 Philistines. You may say, I don't remember that. Well, then you weren't listening to my loosely constructed series in the Old Testament two years ago when I preached on it. Ittai, remember him? Ittai the Gittite. He was from Gath. And listen, it says that Ittai had followed David. When David had hidden from Saul in Gath, he won some souls while he was there. 600 men, Philistines, and their leader named Ittai. They followed David. David said, hey, y'all, just, y'all are new to the party. Y'all don't need to get involved in this personal drama with me and Absalom. Ittai said no, and he swore by the Lord God Jehovah, a Philistine, a warrior. He grew up with heroes like Goliath and Ishbi Benob, but he switched sides. He switched sides. He became the defender of David. I just wondered if maybe Solomon thought about Ittai. He thought about growing up, running around with the very Philistines that once tried to kill David. And he knew that they had been converted, they'd been changed, they had been won, as it were. I don't know if that's what Solomon was thinking about. But I do believe that those those weeks and months before, when Ittai had met David, he realized that David wasn't the same kind of warrior that Goliath was. David's life had a rhythm to it. David had a code that he lived by. It was called God's law. He loved the law. He meditated in God's law. David had been anointed king. Do you know I personally believe that David was under homework? I believe he was continually rewriting the words of the Lord. That was what kings were supposed to do, the Bible says. David, he, even if he wasn't rewriting and camping out in God's Word, he was being inspired by God to write songs. I, I believe Ittai would wake up maybe early in his, his acquaintance with David and he would see David, he would see David rest on the Sabbath. David loved the law of God. I think maybe he would see David that he had a rhythm to his life that the Philistines didn't understand. He began to see that he had a living God. And he began to see David. Listen, I I believe this. Around campfire, Philistines would be probably drunk and foul and David would have his harp and he'd be singing praises to God. Can I tell you what happened? David won him over. David won him over. 
Before long, Ittai said, hey, life is short and warriors sooner or later will die. I want to be with that guy. I want to have what he has. And Ittai joined up. Now, maybe Solomon wasn't thinking of that. Do you know Solomon himself, before he had a wicked midlife crisis and married a thousand women, I mean, more or less, he had concubines in that number, but I mean, he had godly wisdom that he absolutely, completely, practically threw away. But there was a time when Solomon was bringing that kingdom to its zenith that he was the talk of the world. It could be that Solomon was thinking of the Queen of Sheba coming from afar and asking questions. And I don't think she was just asking questions about plants and animals. And I think she was asking questions about bigger things. And Solomon told her, because Solomon as a young man, he knew God. Solomon said, he that winneth souls is wise. David here says, he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, verse 3 in our text. This past week, and by the way, Lauren can vouch for this. I was already studying this before I heard some of the camp messages. Do you know that if you begin to study something, God will do this? He'll begin to hit you with the same stuff. Brother Dean Herring pointed out, that in this passage, verse 3, he says, He's put a new song in my mouth, even praise toward God. Many will hear it. Is that what the verse says? The verse doesn't say that. He says, He put a new song in my mouth. He says, There's even praise toward God. Many will see it. See it. And, and listen, Brother Dean made this point that David wasn't just talking about singing a song or humming a tune with his mouth. He was talking about a life song, living in a new way. When he put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. David was saying that what God did for me, pulling me out of the miry clay, setting my feet on a rock, establishing my goings, giving me a new path to walk and a new song to sing, that that lifestyle would be so compelling that people would see it and begin to trust in the Lord. That's what, that's what David says. You may say, well, a message about song shouldn't have a whole lot to do with soul winning. They're two totally separate things. David said they go together. Yesterday we were working. Brother Mike, Brother DJ, me and three of my kids, Jake Knight showed up, but we were cutting wood and dragging brush. We wanted to do it on the absolute hottest day we could find. <laughs> hey, Brother Mike and DJ are tough. They were dragging brush, cutting. And while we were unloading brush, and I, didn't tell, I did not tell DJ what I was preaching on, but he gave me a great illustration. I was asking him how some of his kids were doing. And he began to share part of his testimony with me about things in his past that he regrets. But then he said this. He said, you know, he said, the kids are having a struggle because I was one way at one time. I was at not a good testimony. He said, but when, we, when God moved on us, to get, when, I trust, when I gave my life to God and decided to get right, and I may be misparaphrasing how he said it, but, this, but he said this. He said, I got rid of all the dark punk rock music. Isn't that what you told me? He said, I started just putting nothing but gospel music. And, and he just, now he mentioned that in passing. He went ahead and shared testimony about how his kids were doing. But I was listening to that and I thought, that's interesting. Sounds like David. God put a new song in there. Now, this song is more than just the words he was singing. But may I make a point that you will likely not walk with the Lord if you fill your head with the world's song all the time. I just believe that, that it is more powerful than you think it is. Many people say, I can listen to anything that's entertainment. does not affect me. You're wrong. Marketing executives who go to school, who study the psychology of buying impulses will tell you, you're wrong. Right? 
People don't believe how important it is, the song they sing. But, it, but it's powerful. If I was to say, baby back, baby back, baby back. Some of you are already finishing. You want baby back ribs. Right? Getting hungry, Brother Clay. Do you know that I've mentioned this before, and it's, this is dated, but during the Super Bowl, and I know it hadn't gone down, so I can just say this, multi-million dollar 30-second time slots. A few years ago, Mountain Dew paid millions and millions of dollars to air for the first time to advertise Mountain Dew Kickstart, which I used to drink a lot right beside my Red Bulls until I had to quit, give all that stuff up. Didn't want to blow a hole in my heart. But do you know they, they had the dumbest advertisement and then somebody wrote a song for them. And the, the song was Puppy Baby Monkey. Puppy Baby Monkey. <laughs> That's all the words that there were. Do you, does it, somebody remember that? The Puppy Baby Monkey? You don't remember it? See, it does it to my head. I, I remembered it, right? If you heard the little jingle and then the guy's doing the, the song, you might remember it, but... They pay that much. Why? They know that sometimes just three words, if they can get it in your head, you'll remember it. Jingles. Today, people pay firms to write jingles for their product because they know that you might forget their product name, but you're likely to remember the song, the jingle. You know, you don't have to put up with any malarkey. Dial one eight 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 sparky right? How many of y'all heard that before? Yeah, and you say, oh, my music doesn't bother me. No, listen, I'm giving those commercials, stating that simply to say this. You think that they spend millions to give you four or five words and a jingle, and yet you think you can listen to music that is inspired by the enemy, the devil. And listen, you may say, what are you talking about? Do you know that there's music genres where the very people that write it will tell you the truth about it? There's, there's, there's people. Do you, do you know B.B. King said his guitar could make people feel immoral? Oh, I don't believe that. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, maybe he doesn't. Listen, there's musicians that will tell you what they're up to in their songs. And if we're not careful, we'll get the world's music in our head and then we wonder why we can't stand against temptation. You listen all week long to sappy and listen, some of it may not be overtly sinful. Some of it's just sappy emotional syrup. And the Bible says we're not to be led by our emotions. We're to be led by the Spirit of God and take our thoughts captive. But when you turn on a song, it does take your thoughts captive. I've become aware of this because listen, before... I know mom and dad didn't know all this, but some of you... before When I was growing up behind mom and dad's back, I listened to everything. That was my vice. I listened to everything. And so there's a time frame where if music that was on the radio during that time frame when I was a teenager, man, I could hear a song two times and have it memorized. Some of our kids are that way. Some of our kids already have all the words to the song we learned this week at camp. And this week we didn't learn a shallow 7-Eleven song. We learned whatever it takes, a beautiful hymn. They're going to sing it tonight. I have to have the music. They sang it every day, every week at camp. I have to have the music. I don't remember it. I'm 45. My brain is full. <laughs> but Samuel and some of those kids, Matthew, David, they were just singing it. It stuck. Can I tell you something, parents? We need to be very careful with what we ingrain in our children's brains. Amen. Because it, it affects you. I can hear just a little jingle. I can go into Ross and they're playing classic country and I can almost sing every song. Because I remember when I was hearing it. Some of them are vile and wicked, but can I tell you this? When I got saved, I have something worth singing about. I have something worth singing about. And there should be a new song. And that song shouldn't be just what comes out of my mouth. But what comes out of my mouth is evidence of what is in my heart. A song can do two things. A song can express what's in your heart. But a song is a very effective way to get something into your heart. When we go to the nursing home, 
I've already mentioned this, but I went with Miss Kathy Frazier a couple weeks ago. And I sat at the piano and I began to play Amazing Grace. And there were patients in the nursing home who are basically, for all practical purposes, catatonic. They don't know where they're at. They don't know who they are. And they wheel them out in a wheelchair. And I begin to sing Amazing Grace. And I look around. And by the time I get to the end, they're singing with me. That's right. You can see that. If you ever want to go and witness that, you just get with our... Every week, I think they still go to the nursing home. It's powerful. If you would go to Isaiah chapter 12. See, the song of the saved is a song of praise. And it's more than just a song. Do you know that when we open our mouths as children of God, that there's more, that we have the ability to share the Lord with people. In Isaiah 12, even though this is a prophecy, it almost sounds like a psalm. Isaiah 12, the prophet says, In that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. And by the way, Jake Knight preached on God's anger, God's wrath. Do you know that if we reject the pardon of Christ Jesus, we will abide under the wrath of God? Right? Right? And he says here, Isaiah, it's almost a salvation verse. Though Thine anger is turned away. Do you know that on the cross of Christ, God's anger turned away from me? Amen. Behold, verse 2, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. Amen. He also has become my salvation. Do you know that in every genre of Old Testament Scripture, in the books of Moses, Exodus 15, 2, and then in the poetry, Psalms 118, 14, this phrase is repeated, that, that the Lord is my strength and my song, He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And can I just say this? If you're saved, you are a well of salvation. What is an artesian well? You ever been to Robber's Cave and went by that one location on the equestrian trail where there's an artesian well? It's a well, but not the kind of well you're thinking of where it's a great big hole. It's a spring that bubbles up out of the ground. They call it the artesian well. Do you know that if you're saved, you should be a well of salvation? Amen. If you're saved, you should care about giving someone else the truth that Jesus Christ can save from wrath, that Jesus Christ can deliver from sin. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation, and in that day ye shall say, Praise the Lord! Call upon His name! Can I just say this? That's a soul winner's job. Amen. Praise the Lord! Call upon His name! Declare His doings among the people, and make mention that His name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord! For he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Do you know one of the most universal words on the planet is hallelujah. 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 Any version of that. And I heard a preacher say that if you say hallelujah or amen, amen, around the world. If you go to a Muslim country say hallelujah, they're going to assume you're a Christian. If you go to communist China and you say hallelujah, amen, somebody in the sound of your voice is going to know he's probably a Christian. Hallelujah, amen. Praise to our God. He says it, is, it will be known in all the earth. And we, listen, I believe there will be a time when the last person in the last language will hear the gospel. Maybe happen sooner than later. And God will say, that's all, let's go. But I close with this fact. Not just the song of the saved, but I want to close with something you may not be familiar with. The Lord is my song, but did you know that the Lord is also a singer? The Lord's a singer. We understand the song of the saved, we've covered that. Psalm 40, Isaiah 12 are good examples in the Old Testament of that. Ephesians 5 says that we will sing if we're full of the Spirit of God. 
If you can, go to Zephaniah. Zephaniah, it's not a book you've been to recently probably, but it's right before Haggai and Zechariah. It's close to the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah. Come on, you haven't read a verse in Zephaniah in so long, you need to look at one. Amen? It's a minor prophet, but this is a major verse. I have a CD and in it, Brother Dennis Jernigan shares his testimony, his salvation testimony of how God brought him out of homosexuality to being someone that leads people to Christ. And by the way, married with kids and grandkids now. And this is one of his life verses. If you allow me to, just start in verse 14 of Zephaniah 3. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Do you know God likes it when we're happy? He likes it when we rejoice. He commands you to rejoice. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He has cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Amen. Who's the he in this verse? God. God. Do you know what I like? I like my kids to rejoice. And Lauren and I are trying to train our kids. Do you know you don't have to teach kids to be grumps? Unless your kids are different than mine, you don't have to teach them to be self-centered, selfish, unhappy. Right? All I need to do to make four of my kids unhappy is to give one of them a snow cone. I have five kids, right? Yesterday we had a little lesson. We pulled up to the snow cone place and one of my kids walked up and I'm going to buy them a snow cone, a very expensive snow cone. And instantly, instead of, Daddy, thank you for bringing us, instantly they, they turn into a little gripe fest because I allowed one of them to get cream in their snow cone or something along those lines. So the, one, the, so the guilty party that was griping, I said, guess what? You get no snow cone. Go get in the van. You said, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. And then we drove off without them getting a snow cone, right? Listen, you, you get a better attitude before you get a snow cone with me. And it's not because I'm mean, but I know that at seven and eight, if I don't teach kids that there's times when rejoicing can be a choice. Rejoice can be a choice, amen? Amen. And we're trying to teach them because God, as they trust Christ and as they grow, even in bad times, God's going to ask us to rejoice. Amen. That's right. Why? First of all, He loves it. But do you know the Bible says that others will see that? Right. Do you know that when you go through hard times and you gripe and complain and the world goes, yep, yeah, been there, let's sing the blues together. But when you go through hard times and somehow you can say, it is well with my soul. Yeah. All of a sudden, the world's going, ha, huh, wonder what they have that I don't have. See, he said, the Lord is my song. And listen, this is important. This isn't something I'm, this isn't a motivational speech. Everybody just smile, you know, singing in the rain. <laughs> That's not the message. Because lost folks can do that. They can benefit from employing some spiritual principles, even though they're lost. But if you're saved, the Lord is your song. He does not change. And not only that, He loves you and He rejoices over you with singing. Do you know that He writes music? God is the one that put the song in the stars. God's the one that puts my, the song in my heart. And when the Holy Spirit of God, that is God. The, listen, a person of the Godhead, the Spirit, He sings in us. 
We, listen, God sings over us. He rejoices over us. He will joy over thee with singing. And I think some of that includes the stars. I don't, listen, I like fireworks, but can I tell you something? If you get me in a really dark place, I can have a pretty awesome night just laying, night, laying up looking at the stars. Listen to God singing over you. Listen, do you know why you need a daily devotion time? You need to get your face in the Word of God and get quiet just to, just to hear God's voice as His children. He will joy over... The, the Lord will and should convict you when you're living for the world. Amen. But when you come to Him and surrender to Him, He'll joy over thee with singing, the Bible says. And not only that, not only does He sing over you, do you know He sings... Through you, you are His song. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. How many can quote that? For by grace are you saved through faith. By the way, do you know how I memorized that? Like this. For by grace are you saved through faith. Kind of goes along with the message. They taught it to me in a song. But he says, by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should work, walk in them. Workmanship, what does that mean? Do you know what the Greek word is? Get you a strong concordance, it's going to blow your mind. It's poem, poem poema, something like that. We're His poem. That's what it says. Fanny Crosby, blind hymn writer, that wrote many of the hymns that you know in your hymn book. She said this, Our lives are all albums written through, with good or ill, with false or true. Our lives are a song. If you allow God the pen, He'll write a song of rejoicing in your life. If you'll submit to the hand of the potter, He'll make a vessel of honor. I want to close Last point about the song of the Savior. Not only are we His song, and He sings over us, Zephaniah says, but you know the Bible says that Jesus sang. Matthew 26, 30, also repeated in Mark. After the Lord's Supper, after He infused the Passover with new meaning, after He broke bread and said, this is the New Testament in my blood, this is my body broken for you. Listen, before He went to the Mount of Olives and after He broke bread, the Bible says, and they sang a hymn, then went out into the Mount of Olives. So everybody was getting up, they were cleaning up the, the supper, and they broke into song. Amen. Wish I could have been there. Hear Jesus singing. He sang, the Bible says. And then he went out and he wept. And then he was betrayed. And then he died for you and for me. He died for our sins. You know, when I read the gospel that Jesus died for my sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he rose again. It's like the song, it starts to take a minor key, but then it crescendos into the climax of, He arose! That's the song of the gospel. Are you living that? Listen, I pray that as you study in God's Word, His Spirit would fill you with a song. So the question that I ask, do you have a song? Is your life song being written by the great songwriter? Or are you messing it up with your own gibberish? You know, sometimes I, I can do a poor version of Furry Lease. Sometimes I'll tell the kids, hey, do you want to hear a song I wrote? I'll sit down and, na 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 And they'll go, you didn't write that. <laughs> you haven't heard how bad I mess it up. Just hang on. <laughs> I rewrote it. Can I just say this? God's not going to write a mess into your life. Some of you young people, you're messing up God's song. Listen, you're, you're allowing people to jot down stuff on the paper of your life. You're, you're taking the own pen. Listen, it's, it, it's like me when I'm trying to teach my kids to write the right way in their strong will. Listen, if somebody's hand is over a little kid's hand and they're trying to write the letter A, if they don't write the letter A, it's because that little sucker was resisting the hand. Jesus sings over us. He wants to write a poem with your life. 
In Revelation 15, the Bible ends by saying, verses 1 through 4, they, in the end, that redeemed throng, they don't just sing the song of Moses. The Bible says they sing the song of the Lamb, His song. But you ought to line up. M music, music's kind of exclusive. It's narrow-minded. You know, if I play Amazing Grace, you'll know that's Amazing Grace. If I play Twinkle, Twinkle, you'll know that's Twinkle, Twinkle, or possibly the alphabet song. But, but, but do you know that music has meter? Music has a key that you've got to stay in. And some people have a hard time with that, but we, that's what it's supposed to be. Is your life song off key? Do you know you could get lined up with, with God's song this morning? If you're not saved... If you're not saved, then you cannot say that, God, you have turned away your wrath. You cannot say, God, you're, the judgments that I deserved, you carried away, like Isaiah said. No, if you've rejected Christ, then you are under God's wrath. There's nothing to sing about. But He'll save you. He died for you. I'm going to ask Miss Kristen to come to the piano. This, the invitation song, unless something's changed, is, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have thine own way. At Lindsay Chapel, we like to have a time of invitation, and that's not to twist your arm or get you to do something emotional that's not real. But if you're here and you're not saved, Jesus wants to save you. If you've been a hearer of the Word and not a doer of the Word... Listen, some of you, evangelism is a hard task because... You don't have the soul winner song in your heart. You don't have the... The Savior is not your song. You're singing the world's tunes. You're living a lifestyle that is not praise to our God. What is a lifestyle that praises God? Jesus put it this way. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our life song is not to bring us glory. Our life song is to bring Him glory. So if you would stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. During our invitation, if you're not sure about whether you're saved or not, you may say, what, what is that term saved? Well, listen, Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You need to be saved. You need to be saved from sin, saved from hell, the, penal the penalty of sin. And you can do that by calling on the name of the Lord and repenting as she plays with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you come? Listen, some of you say, Brother Clay, I'm saved, but boy, I'm not sure I want God writing every part of my song. Listen, you're foolish. He loves you. Let Him write the song. Listen, many of us, we've messed up the first few stanzas, but God can redeem it. If you're here this morning and you need to talk to somebody, the pastor's here, he'll, he'll direct you to someone who can pray with you. If you can do business with God, then just come. Maybe where you sit, you can spend time with the Lord, but that's what this time is for. Don't worry about the time. Spend time with God. Do you need to come? Are you saved? If you're saved... How has your life song been sounding recently? I haven't been specific, but maybe there's a particular sin that easily trips you up and God has dealt with you about it. You young people, some of you, you're out of tune. You're, you're rebelling against your folks. Some of us are allowing bitter, bitterness, unforgiveness, some harsh notes into the song that God wants to be singing through us. If God deals with you, would you come? If you would turn to page 294. We had some decisions made at camp. If, you're, if you've been saved this week, would you come to the pastor here? There may be other things you're doing. If you need to come, would you come? Meanwhile, those of you that are standing, turn to page 294. Would you sing the first verse with me? Have thine own way. From our hearts, can we sing this out? 
Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Amen. And uh, we have uh, some announcements to make. Colton, come on down here, buddy. All right, and Cowboy and Felicia, y'all come. We had a great week at camp. On Monday or Tuesday, Colton Benet came. Colton's been in our church. Lonnie and Shelly have been a great part of our church. And Colton had asked us in the past about salvation. Monday and Tuesday, he asked me about being saved, but just wasn't quite ready to do that. He, he had understood, but through the preaching, I believe, was it Thursday evening? Wednesday or th Thursday evening, uh, Colton came to me. He said, Brother Clay, I want to get saved. Yeah. Colton, did you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And you know what he told me this morning? He said, Brother Clay, he said, I didn't do it at camp, but can I, can I be a preacher boy? Can I prepare a message? I said, you can, absolutely. Hey. So uh, I praise God for Colton. Amen. And then that, that same night, Miss Felicia and Denim came. Denim is one of our church girls. And Denim had been asking, and she prayed to receive Jesus. Is that right, Denim? You trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. And we'll be talking to them. We'll be talking to them about baptism. And then the Sager family came. I wasn't down there, but Dan and uh, Liz, I knew that, Dad. I was getting ready to say that. She's the only one that doesn't start with a D. Amen. And then we have Derek, Doug, and Drake. And they've come, is it, they come to join? To join in fellowship with the church. They've moved from, I don't know, Michigan, Ohio, somewhere way up north. Was it Michigan? Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they've come down to God's country. They want to join in fellowship with our church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you all. Thank you. And, uh... Yes, sir. Powerful message. Amen. Amen. And uh, since it was about a song, Clay, I want you to stay right here. If you've got a hymnal, we're going to sing a song. 547, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. Pastor Clay is going to lead us in the first and last verse of that. And I want you to pay really close attention to the last verse. It is a powerful, powerful verse about a song. So, Pastor Clay, lead us in the first and last verse of I Stand Amazed in the Presence. All right. Everybody sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me when with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how Savior's love for me. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brother Chet, would you make your way uh, to the pulpit, please? As Chet comes, do remember tonight we're going to have camp reports. You're going to get to have four five minute messages. Won't that be awesome? Amen. Come on, Brother Chet. Hey. Brother Chet, dismiss us, please.
Well, if they turn into 10 or 15, we're just going to let them do it. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord, or today, Lord, that we would just uh, be sensitive to the Spirit in our lives. And, Father, the lesson today...